Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. Animosity in the workplace and elsewhere is sometimes directed at trans and gender nonconforming individuals. There are 25,000 TGNC people in Missouri. The American Civil Liberties Union has been conducting an awareness and education campaign to develop allies for and a better understanding of issues facing the TGNC population and to make Missouri safe and welcoming for all genders. Joining me in studio to talk about it is the ACLU Missouri's Transgender Education and Advocacy Program Coordinator, J. Marie Hill. Elaine Bruni is board chair of Metro Trans Umbrella Group, and Lady Ashley Gregory, lead organizer of queer and trans people of color at Metro Trans Umbrella Group. Thank you all for being with me. Nice to have you. J. Marie, let me start with you. Um, this campaign that you waged to seeking allies, why did you feel that was necessary and how did it go? Absolutely. Well, thank you again for having us, Don. And basically, you know, Missouri is, a, is more welcoming than ever. We've, we've passed Mona out of the House Committee, which um, for those who don't know, Missouri has the Non-Discrimination Act that we're seeking to pass. We've been trying to pass for 20 years. <laughs> and it's, you know, making sure that people, when they are at work or they're in public spaces, they won't get discriminated against for being transgender or gender nonconforming. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that we felt like we needed to do this campaign was because we felt like publicly and just in terms of the education of the general public, that we wanted to make sure people had more awareness of what trans and gender nonconforming people face, and also that we set the stage for people to be joyful as we seek these these protections and not um, to kind of further the narrative that transgender identity or the things that we face are, you know, things are very difficult and there is a lot of discrimination, but there is this aspect of our lives that kind of gets muted out, which is our aspect of seeking joy and being full people. And that really gets limited when people talk um, about transgender identity and, and issues and so we wanted to make sure that that was infused in this campaign, this education campaign, because we work, like I said, both on policy with Mona and also in cultural ways. Well, how, how did it go? Do you feel it was a, a success? Absolutely. It was incredible. I think, you know, uh, we had a debrief yesterday internally and actually essentially one of the ways that we realized people were reeling was that they were shocked with joy. They were like, you know, what is it? What is the space where I get to be a full person, get to be loved for who I am and get to feel recognized as opposed to dismissed or ignored or even, you know, antagonized for it. And so we were really grateful for the reception. And I think they were grateful for us. It was this mutual exchange of, of resources, of care, of, you know, uh, a platform for different artists and different speakers to share their stories without regard for, you know, we don't believe you or we think you might be telling us something that's not true. It was very beautiful to see people's reactions and also to see the artists that were, you know, on display and sharing their skills. People really enjoyed the, the experience for sure. Elaine, was your organization involved in, in this project at all? Oh, uh, yes. We, we had representatives at a lot of the stages of the uh, campaign and Jay Marie has reached out and worked with MTUG on many occasions. We have a good relationship with the ACLU. What, what are the kind of challenges that you see in this community for, for you? Um, I'm not as worried about myself as I am about our homeless and our trans and gender non-binary folks of color. They face many discriminations in joblessness, housing, all sorts of things. Uh, combining that with the homeless population, we have no place for our homeless folks to go. Mm -hmm. And Lady Ashley, you are African American, and I assume that race also plays in, uh, plays a role in this uh, this whole issue. Yes, race does play a role in the issue. Um, I think that we have to realize that there are marginalized communities that already face biases and stereotypes. Um, when you add added personality, identity, such as um, whether you identify as queer, whether you identify as transgender, those definitely do increase. Um, and those are things that we do have to worry about because you already have so many things stacked against you. When gender identity comes into the picture, that just adds one more aspect of things that you have to worry about. Yeah. There is an elephant in the room, uh, thanks to uh, President Trump's administration. I think we have to talk about that before we continue. And that is, I'm sure that you heard over the weekend that the an administration is planning on and probably will redefine gender identity. 
Jay Marie, let me start with you. What do you think of that, and how would that impact you? Yeah, it was incredibly disappointing to hear that. Um, on Sunday, I woke up to that uh, and to that news, and um, you know, the first thing I thought was make you know was was mostly that this is just another assault on our community that's already handling a lot every day. Um, and the reality of this is that people are, are already having trouble accessing health care, right? Being able to walk into a doctor's office and have their bodies and their journey respected for what it fully contains. And so that's, you know, th that sort of thing is already difficult. People are already being laughed out of job interviews, right? Because they don't look like the gender that they're on their, you know, on their documents. And so this is, these are kind of cultural things that are already accepted in a way. And so to have, you know, one of the people in the highest laws of the land, uh, highest offices in the land, you know, um, say it's okay to continue or to even further discriminate against people based on archaic, deeply archaic and out of the ideas about gender and how the binary works is not only harmful, but actually going to increase the rates of murders, increase the rates of, you know, harm that our communities face. People are already at a rate of 41% out of, you know, 100 commit suicide, right, or attempt suicide. And so our community is already reeling from the difficulties of existing in public space. And, you know, this is going to be a really difficult blow to our communities no matter how you spin it. So yeah, I think we're all kind of making sure that we are taking care of each other and looking looking for how we can be there for one another and also preparing for the, you know, the legal fights that will come, um, but wanting to be rooted in our in our resilience before we even get engaged in that conversation. How would it impact the legal fights? I mean, you talk about uh, legislation in Missouri that's been hanging around for 20 years. Right. If this uh, were implemented, how might it affect uh, that? Right. Well, we're already in a difficult spot in Missouri, right? A lot of my work is is pushing to, to get the Missouri Non-Discrimination Act passed, right? Which would say, you know, if, if I have a discrimination situation at a workplace or at a school or anything like that, I would have legal grounds to sue someone or to find, you know, recourse in that, in that way. But because we are already hanging in the balance and folks, you know, 25,000 folks lives are already on the line. What's going to be difficult about this, you know, ensuing fight is that we're going to have to be pushing even more against the cultural norm that people can walk into a space and be discriminated against just because of how they look um, or be denied health care, denied prescriptions and things that they are physically in desperate need of because someone thinks that they shouldn't be wearing what they're wearing or shouldn't put makeup on their face. Like these are such arbitrary things that are deeply going to impact people's ability to survive. Elaine, what do you make of that proposal? It's very disturbing. Um, it's not, it doesn't have any sound scientific basis to it. That's the most disturbing fact of all. And seeing, uh, folks that, that I have seen who have uh, transitioned, have uh, identified as gender non-binary, to see their what, what would happen to their mental health, it would be devastating, mm -hmm. I think, to yeah. many people. Yeah. Lady Ashley, I, I'm assuming you're going to come from the same uh, same angle on this. I am coming from the same angle, and I do believe the same things. Um, it can be difficult um, to live an authentic life when these things are facing you. Um, I feel that you are taking away the civil rights of people who deserve them. Um, one thing I read was that these laws that were being passed would take away the civil rights from people who don't deserve them. And that is completely bogus to me because everybody deserves their civil rights. Everybody deserves equality and equity. And I don't think that's fair. Where is the trans world now compared to where it might have been five years ago or 10 years ago? Um, well, I think from my viewpoint, and I will say that I'm an ally, I've been able to see that people are living their more authentic lives. People are being able to step out in the clothes that they want to wear and the gender identities that they want to present and feel comfortable. And I think that, you know, recently, even in media, we've seen more transgender activists mm -hmm. and actresses and actors and, and sitcoms, and if, you will. sitcoms yeah. and if you will and visibility is important and I think with that visibility comes a form of comfort for many folks who probably normally weren't used to seeing people who identified the same way that they identified in public. Mm -hmm. Elaine how about uh, how about you? How do you see it different? I, I totally agree with Lady Ashley, and, and our group, Metro Trans Umbrella Group, started as a grassroots organization five years ago with two support groups serving approximately 25, 30 people a month. We now have eight active support groups, and we serve at least 150 people a month. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very important for social and emotional needs to be met. So a lot of these people are uh, more confident throughout everything they do in their lives now. Yeah. One thing I would add, just in terms of 
five years ago versus now, right? Mm-hmm. Is so because we have experienced a, a in some spaces, in some cities, a greater sense of safety and a greater sense of community in public, what that is also doing is pushing us to say systemically, right, these things that are in our organization's policies, kind of the embedded cultural norms, we're really mm-hmm. working to actually uproot those because those are some of the things that keep people in their minds from understanding what someone is up to or from really um, making a safe, welcoming space for them to work at or for them to in, you know, engage in their education at that at that space like if you know if you walk in and somebody expects you to be a certain gender and you don't do those certain you know gender norms like it can sometimes people have a hard time actually serving you as the as the student that you are as the worker that you are right like in our toolkit that we we um put out as a part of the the education campaign you know we have someone who gave us a quote that they are at you know they were at work and one of their bosses outed them and said like their dead name said the name that they don't use anymore Mm -hmm. and that outed them in front of all of their staff and that kind of really ruptured the work that they had done to create these relationships with people. And it made it difficult for them to feel safe at work, for them to know that they could go to work, get their paycheck, go home. These moments of that seem, dif- that seem simple really actually can completely change someone's re- relationship to a building, to an event, to a you know, responsibility space like work. Well, let's be clear on what we're talking about when we talk about safe places. Some people might interpret that to mean that you feel that uh, you are th- threatened somehow and that you're possibly physically harmed. Yeah, and that's definitely possible. So, for instance, for this, you know, this work example, right, say someone was working, and we didn't have all the details of their, ex- of their experience, but say they're working at a construction site, right, and they were um, a trans guy, so they historically, maybe in their life, had been assigned woman at birth. And at, in their journey, they just transition to be, being male presenting or li- living as a guy, right? And if you're working a bunch of, a, a, among a bunch of other construction folks, you know, like a lot, of, a lot of those are just your guys' guys. You know, they don't really think probably too much about gender oftentimes. It's just they go to work, hit some stuff, build some stuff, pick it up, be heavy, be strong, you know, do what they're really good at. Mm-hmm. And if this group of people didn't know that this person used to be like a woman and they somebody on that team has a problem with that, that actually, the, the issues that we have with gender is that people often respond to being frustrated about someone else's gender violently because mm-hmm. they're angry. And that's not the person who's transitioning's fault, but they have to deal with the fact that someone else might not know what to do and they might lash out at them. So it's, there always is a risk of violence because you never know what someone else's story and expectations around gender are. And oftentimes this is usually directed at trans women, people who have lived as men and transitioned towards living life as women. But there's always a threat of violence because really culturally it's been okay to hurt people because of their gender. Hate crimes are really difficult to pass, right? Or to assign to different you know, cases because it's been okay to, to say people's gender is not important and if they get killed, that's their fault. It's very difficult to classify a hate crime. I mean, it's very difficult to, for the police to do that and do it uh, authoritatively. Partly because of the cultural yeah. world that we live in, right? Right. That's how that works. Lady Ashley, have you been exposed to that? Can you elaborate on that a little bit for me? On the kind of things that uh, that we've just heard with regard to uh, uh, it being exposed to threats, violence, that sort of thing. So I think any time when you're in a marginalized community, those are things that you kind of expect that are coming your way. Um, me personally, I have not experienced any threats to my well-being, but I do have trans and gender non- non-conforming friends, um, trans women of color mm-hmm. who every day face just walking down the street mm-hmm. having people say inappropriate and violent things to them based on how they identify or how they represent. So it comes to me through people I love, through people I care about, through their lived experiences. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to see that this is a serious issue and it's something that we have to take into consideration and do something about before hate crimes continue to rise. Elaine, how about you? Um, I didn't really present as gender non-binary until after I retired from my job. And then when I went back into that same situation as a substitute, wearing a shirt and tie to work every day, I was much more validated in my position than I was before. Um, I, I sometimes feel the threat in uh, bathroom situations that are gendered male or female mm-hmm. instead of just a one door you know, situation. It, it can be a little scary sometimes. It's interesting, I have to take a break, but it is interesting that this, this dialogue, I think in a very general way, always seems to focus on the restroom. That's the only thing we really hear. I mean, the community at large hears about uh, the trans issue. 
Yeah, and it's a shame, right? Because there's so many other areas oh, yeah. that we as a community have to face violence and have mm-hmm. to face not knowing what someone's going to do. We walk out of our houses and have to be on guard, mm-hmm. right? And so when people snap at maybe certain things from folks, because it's frustrating when people don't get your pronouns right or when people completely disengage with the way you're presenting, it can be really frustrating, mostly because we're already dealing with this cloud. It's in the air we breathe that it's okay to make fun of people for their gender presentation, and that's it's ultimately not okay And what we're really seeking to change. Not a great way to live. Not at all. Not a great way to live. Have to take a break. We'll do that now. We are talking with Jay Marie Hill, ACLU's Missouri Transgender Education and Advocacy Program Coordinator. Elaine Bruni is board chair of Metro Trans Umbrella Group. And Lady Ashley Gregory is also with Metro Trans Umbrella Group. Back to continue this conversation in just a moment. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast supported by University College at Washington University with undergraduate and graduate programs part-time evening and online. University College at Washington University offering world-class education within reach. Welcome back to our conversation about having a better understanding of trans and gender non-conforming people. We have a, a listener who has uh, communicated uh, to us via Twitter, says, uh, the listener writes, one step in allyship and cultural change involves language and understanding how it evolves. For instance, the shift from preferred pronouns to simply pronouns. I'm curious about non-binary. Is it replacing non-conforming? Elaine, you reacted to that. Do you want to respond? Everybody has their own identity. Some identify as gender nonconforming, some some gender nonbinary, and many terms under the umbrella. I think it just depends on the individual, mm-hmm. and I don't I don't know that both that the terms are interchangeable, but some folks may use them interchangeably mm-hmm. with their own identification. There is a whole language, though, is there not, Lady Gregory? That uh, that people. On the outside, if you will, looking in, sometimes struggle to understand. We talked about binary and non-binary, binary, and there are many other terms, pronouns, for instance, that uh, you know sometimes uh, cause difficulty for people. Uh, go ahead. You know, I always say pronouns, we learn about them in grade school, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that hard. It's not a hard concept to grasp. I think the concept that we need to grasp is that we need to respect people, and if they want to be acknowledged by the pronouns that they choose, that's what we need to do. Um, language itself, I feel like, is not difficult to understand. It's just growing accustomed to it and also putting it into practice. That's one of the main things that we have to learn about allyship is that we have to acknowledge people for who they are. So language is not difficult. It's working on your reaction to people and how they want to be identified. That can sometimes be difficult. I mean, and and looking at the trans world, uh, it wasn't too awfully long ago, for instance, that the word queer was a word that uh, was very much in the pejorative. Now it seems to be favored. Uh, what, what's going on here? Yeah, I think, well, you know, words change and, and generations reclaim decades of hurt, right? To say, actually, instead of letting this be used as a weapon against me, I'm going to make sure that I don't, I take all the pain out of this word. Mm-hmm. And and the, the reality of it is that queer is also an expansive word, right? It allows you to say, well, maybe, you know, and it, for, for, for trans folks, right, it can be opening because it's saying, regardless of my gender identity, right, my, the L G B or T, the L G B piece, right, which is essentially rooted in, who are you and who do you like or who do you love who you're attracted to? Queer allows for the journey of transness, the journey of sexuality shifting and changing. And so, yes, it, it historically has been difficult. And I think one of the things, at least for me as a young person when I was coming up, watching people use words and use them powerfully is such a beautiful thing. And it's going to continue to happen. You know, one day gender nonconforming, gender nonbinary might not even be the words we use, mm-hmm. right? But the reality is what the lessons we can learn from our attempts to shape language and to shape our communities is what we're trying to teach people is what the cultural organizing piece is that, you know, it might be difficult, it might be unusual, right? But what I'm telling you is I'm ha- I have a power over my body and over my narrative that I'm going to welcome you into and encourage you to have your own narrative about your body, too. You take the you word and own it. it. You own the word. Own it and own the whole experience of it and teach people along the way. But, you know, not for their well-being, for your own openness, for your own sense of freedom. Sure. We have a caller who wants to get into this conversation. Let's uh, bring him in at this juncture. Then I want to talk about your toolkit because I think that's cool. probably the principal reason yeah, you're I'm here. I'm excited to tell you. Thank <laughs> you for yeah. let's, pr- let's hear from Philip. He's on the line. Philip, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, Don. Uh, my name is Philip. I'm with the City of St. Louis Civil Rights Enforcement Agency. 
And uh, I just want to put out for, for the listeners who may not know, but I'm sure the guests probably do know, that the city of St. Louis does uh, provide legal protection for transgender individuals under city ordinance 68715. It protects gender identity and expression in the areas of employment and housing and public accommodations, and that's that's been on the books since July 13th in 2010. Okay, eight years it's been on the books. Thoughts? It's a, it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. Right. We, we live in a little island here in St. Yeah. Louis City, and we're grateful for, for the protections that we have. And there, there are other cities, too, right, that mm-hmm. have it. Kansas City, other cities in between here and there, Columbia. But it's the state, you know, still uses the fact that there's no statewide protections kind of against the community. So we really make sure that people understand that they're legislating harm. And that's a big part of, you know, why we're mobilizing around this issue at all. Lady Ashley, they, the state has some catching up to do. The, ca- the state does have some catching up to do, and I think when you try to pass overall laws that kind of bounce out the smaller ones that we have here, that's when problems are created. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that they can go to the state laws that they see and use those as excuses or reasons behind their actions in doing what they want to do, which is why we have to approach it not only from our local level but from our state level as well. What is the national mood doing to all of this? I mean, we're living in a time of polarization and, of quote, the other, and whoever the other may be, but uh, apparently whoever you are, you can classify whomever you choose as the other. This is going on in the country today. How is that impacting you guys? Elaine? Oh, wow. It's a struggle. And I, I think that um, we want to put ourselves out there and educate people and develop and you know, just be there for our community. And I think the education piece is very important. Um, a lot of people don't know tran- any transgender or gender non-binary, non-conforming folks, or they don't know that they know mm-hmm. those people. And I think putting a human face to that is really important because we're all just people. Yeah, look what it's done in the gay community, for instance. As more people have come out and you realize that maybe your your son or your daughter or your cousin is gay and you didn't know it, and it, there is a face there, and it's much more welcoming, I think, uh, and inclusive. Any thoughts on that, Lady Ashley? I think, like I said before, visibility is key. Yeah. I think when you have people that you can relate to, people that you can understand, um, whether they be in your life or whether they be in media, it definitely makes things, I don't want to say easier, but it makes them easier to cope with, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's definitely key is having that visibility. Okay. Now let's talk about that uh, toolkit because uh, th- that's what you've been up to for the last 10 days or for most part of, uh, of October, Jay Marie. Uh, what tools do you have in that kit that are going to change some of the things that we've been talking about here? Absolutely. So yeah, just to, to clarify the, the many, many things we've been up to. So in the 10 days leading up to National Coming Out Day, which was on October 11th, mm-hmm. We had a campaign called 10 Days of Trans Demands. And that campaign was essentially a container um, where we did every day we had a different demand, right? And it was based on our toolkit, this trans ally toolkit that we created that has seven sections and really helps people, it it seeks to help people be an ally to trans and gender nonconforming people in a multitude of settings. So healthcare, workplace, education settings, faith spaces, in your family. Um, and, And also specifically, we talked about earlier, the race component, right? There's black and people of color like there's a different experience when you add race to Mm -hmm. the the gender experience and so that's a good that's a piece in there and we wanted to make sure that in addition to those five race people had a a way to understand how to support trans folks in public spaces too Mm -hmm. so it's seven sections and there's four to five kind of action steps about what you could be doing without having to ask a trans person without having to you know put that labor onto them to say you know i'm an ally i don't have to wake up every day and be nervous about my gender presentation, what can I be doing at my workplace to make it safer, right? What can I be doing in my faith space to make sure that people who want to be a, have a spiritual journey can still come here and feel safe to do that? Where could people get a hold of this uh, toolkit? Absolutely. So it's on the ACLU website. Can I give the, the link? It's yeah, pretty, and, pretty we'll, and we'll put a link on our website, awesome. too, to make it easy. But go ahead. But yeah, go ahead. it's the aclu-mo.org slash raise your voice and there you people can download both the report version of the toolkit that actually has resources in the back and a short glossary of terms for things that people might not have heard before and then there's also a smaller zine version that's a little bit more accessible it's just the content no letter no glossary 
We, we don't have time to go into all of the different categories that you mentioned, but we are doing a segment following your appearance here today on discrimination in the workplace. Uh, tell me what the toolkit says about uh, the workplace. Then. Yeah, absolutely. So there are several things one can be doing, but one of the, a few of the main things are we ask that people create a culture of advocacy, create a culture of support for, stu- for staff and for folks who are going through legal and transition paperwork, right, and for people who may not present as their gender might make it seem. We yeah. ask that people create, you know, prepare a, c- a whole container of, of space. So have Let me just ask, are you talking about HR doing this in the workplace or yeah. the boss or just uh, any so HR would be Right, HR would be the, f- the folks that I- implement and make sure people abide by it. But there's also a sense of, you know, all workers or all people at all levels of the organization can be doing their part to normalize this new thing that is new for people sometimes. And, we, and it, you know, whenever you're doing something uncomfortable, how you mm-hmm. manage that change is super important, right? And every Everybody has a role to like making people at work feel safe. HR is just their job to like legally do it, but there is something that we can all do when it comes to pronouns, but including that in your email signature, really being, you know, if you get taken aback at someone's gender experience, like really, like Lady Ashley said, looking at your own experience saying, well, how can I fix that on my own side and not project that my discomfort or any of my confusion onto this person who has enough when they walk out the door every day? Well, I understand what you're saying with regard to the non-trans employees. What about, what's the responsibility of the trans worker? Well, I think everybody who is trans is always just trying to be their most honest, most you know, clear and loving self. So as they seek their own journey out, I think they're going to do their best to say, to be honest about what they need, to say, hey, this would be really helpful in this particular aspect of my experience here at work or at school, right? Like, this is my name. I need you to call me by my name. Mm-hmm. And don't deviate from it. If you knew me by a different name, we're changing that. This is a different experience, and I need you to be mm-hmm. along with me here. It might be, you know, I'm going to wear this to work, and you got to kind of be okay with that. And by mm-hmm. kind, I mean really. you got to figure out what might be coming up for you and just just find a way that, you know, whatever it pings inside you, the discomfort, figure out what your gender stuff is that kind of makes that happen and don't project that onto me and say, you know, maybe we won't be learning together, but the the person who is trans essentially has enough labor just being themselves. So we're asking that people really do that internal work to kind of process or talk to a friend or a family member and really make it a more normal, regular conversation so that folks who are surviving as trans and gender nonconforming in the state of Missouri can feel safe, can feel comfortable talking to just anybody and not having to go only to a support group, right? Or only to a place that they know has a, has a, a safe gender you know, policy, but because that's so few places. That shouldn't be too much to ask. Should shouldn't, it? I don't shouldn't think so. be. Okay, we're gonna have to wrap this up and I'm gonna get a final thought from each of you. And I'll start with you, Lady Ashley. What do you want the takeaway from your perspective to be for, uh, for our audience today from this conversation? I want people to realize, especially cisgender folks um, like myself who can be allies, is that Explain they, what cisgender is. There again, not everybody understands what you're saying. Thank you. Cisgender mm-hmm. means that you identify um, with your sex that you were assigned at birth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want people to really hold themselves accountable to see what they can do to help the trans community, to, to acknowledge pronouns that people have, to take the time to do the research, because it's not always a trans person's responsibility to explain their lived experience to you. Take the time to find out things that you need to know. Take the time to ask questions. Take the time to speak up and not over trans people when they talk about their experiences. That's the one thing that I want people to take away from this is to hold themselves accountable for being good human beings. Elaine, how about you? Take away. Exactly what Lady Ashley said. Learn what you don't know and just be just be accommodating to people, you know, um, everybody's human, you know, you be generous with yourself and, uh, open up your space to folks that you don't know about and, um, listen to them. Really listen. Final, final word. Yeah. My final word is just that, you know, trans folks and gender non-conforming folks, gender non-binary folks, um, there's a mountain ahead of them every day. And that we just ask, you know, even as we're living in this particular political climate, um, even as we're dealing with so many different issues, that people really carve out space for understanding this gender conversation and for really finding ways to be allies in everyday life and make space for trans joy, really. Because people talk about us as if all we are is sad, complaining (laughs) beings, when really we're just trying to have a full life like everybody else. And there are systems and policies in the way of that. And we can actually change that together. Well, I want to thank you all for being here and and talking about this. Uh, It's an important conversation. I hope a lot of people are listening. Thank you all. Jay Marie Hill, thank you. Lady Ashley Gregory, thank you so much for being with us. Elaine Bruni, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU.
Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.